Is there shortcuts we can take to artificially engineering living organisms? Artificial life, artificial consciousness, artificial intelligence. So maybe just looking pragmatically at the uh, LLMs we have now, do you think those can exhibit qualities of life, qualities of consciousness? qualities of intelligence and the way we think of intelligence. I mean, I think that. they already do, but not in the way I hear popularly discussed. So they're obviously signatures of intelligence and um and and a part of a ecosystem of intelligent systems, but I don't know that individually uh you know, I would assign all the properties to them that people have. It's a little like uh, so, you know, we talked about the history of eyes before and like how eyes scaled up into technological forms. And language has also had a really interesting history and got much more interesting, I think, once we started writing it down um, and then, you know, in inventing books and things. But like, you know, every time that we started uh, storing language in a new way, uh, you know, where we were kind of existentially traumatized by it. So like, you know, the idea of written language was traumatic because it seemed like the dead were speaking to us, even though they were deceased and books were traumatic because, um, you know, like suddenly there were lots of copies of this information available to everyone and it was going to somehow dilute, dilute it. And large language models are kind of interesting because they don't feel as static. They're very dynamic. But if you think about language in the way I was describing it before, is language is this very large in time structure. And before it had been something that was distributed over human brains as a dynamic structure. And occasionally we store components of that very large dynamic structure in books or in written language. Now we can actually store the dynamics of that structure in a physical artifact, which is a large language model. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think about it almost like the evolution of genomes in some sense where, you know, there might've been like really primitive genes on the first living things and they could, they didn't store a lot of information or they were like really messy. Um, and then we, you know, like you, by the time you get to the eukaryotic cell, you have this really dynamic genetic architecture that's read writable, right? And like, and has all of these different properties. And I think large language models are kind of like the genetic system for language. Um, in some sense, where it's it's allowing and a sort of archiving that's highly dynamic. Um, and I think it's very paradoxical to us because obviously in human history, we haven't been used to conversing with anything that's not human. Um, but now we can converse uh, basically with a crystallization of human language in a computer. Uh, that's a highly dynamic crystal because it's a crystallization in time of this massive abstract structure that's evolved over human history and is now put into a small device. I think crystallization kind of implies a, a limit on its capabilities. I think there's not, a, I mean it very purposefully because a particular instantiation of a language model trained on a particular data set becomes a crystal of the language at that time it was trained. But obviously we're iterating with the technology and evolving it. I guess the question is, when you crystallize it, when you compress it, when yeah. you archive it, you're archiving some slice of the collective intelligence yes. of the human species. That's right. And the question is, like, how powerful is that? Right. It's a societal level technology, right? We've actually put collective intelligence in a box. Yeah. I mean, how much smarter is the collective intelligence of humans versus a single human? And that's... Yeah. That's the question of AGI versus uh, human level intelligence, superhuman level intelligence versus human level intelligence. Like how much smarter can this thing, when done well, when we solve a lot of the uh, complexity, computation complexities, maybe there's some data complexities and how to really archive this thing, crystallize this thing really well. Yeah. How powerful is this thing gonna be? Like what's your I, I think, I, I actually, I don't like, the sort of language we use around that. And I think the language really matters. Um, so I don't know how to talk about how much smarter one human is than another, right? Like usually we talk about abilities or particular talents someone has. Um, and, you know, going back to, you know, David Deutsch's idea of universal explainers, it, like, you know, adopting the view that, uh, you know, we're the first you know, kinds of structures our biosphere has built that can understand the rest of reality. We have this a universal comprehension capability. Um, 
you know, he makes an argument that uh, basically we're the first things that actually are capable of understanding anything. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean an individual understands everything, but like we're, we have that capability. And so there's not a difference between that and what people talk about with AGI. In some sense, AGI is a universal explainer. But, you know, like it might be that a computer is much more efficient at doing, um, you know, uh, I don't know, prime factorization or something than a human is, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily smarter or has a broader reach of the kind of things that can understand than a human does. And so I think we really have to think about, is it a level shift or is it we're enhancing certain kinds of capabilities humans have in the same way that we can enhance eyesight by making telescopes and microscopes? Are we enhancing capabilities we have into technologies and the entire global ecosystem is getting more intelligent? Or is it really that we're building some super machine in a box that's going to be smart and kill everybody? Like, I, like that sounds like a science, like it's not, it's not even a science fiction narrative. It's a bad science fiction narrative. I like, I just don't think it's actually accurate to any of the technologies we're building or the way that we should be describing them. It's not even how we should be describing ourselves. So the benevolent story is, there's a benevolent system that's able to uh, transform our economy, our way of life by just, you know, 10xing the GDP of Well, these are human like questions, right? I don't think they're necessarily questions that we're going to like outsource to an artificial intelligence. I think what is happening and will continue to happen is there's a co-evolution between humans and technology that's happening. And we're coexisting in this ecosystem right now, and we're maintaining a lot of the balance. And for the balance to shift to the technology would require some very bad human actors, which is a real risk, or some sort of, um, I don't know, some sort of dynamic that favors like, I, I just don't know how that plays out without human agency actually trying to put it in that direction. It could also be how rapid the rate. The rapid the rate is scary. So, like, I think the things that are, you know, terrifying are, um, you know, the ideas of deep fakes or, um, you know, like, you know, all the, the kinds of issues that become legal issues about artificial intelligence technologies. Um, and uh, using them to control weapons or uh, using them for, you know, like child pornography or, you know, like, the, or like, you know, faking out that someone's, um, you know, loved one was kidnapped or killed and it, you know, like, and ran, like, there's all kinds of things that are super scary in this landscape and all kinds of new legislation needs to be built and all kinds of um, guardrails on the technology to make sure that people don't abuse it need to be built. And that, needs to happen. And I think one function of sort of the artificial intelligence uh, doomsday uh, sort of part of our culture right now is it's sort of our immune response to knowing that's coming. Um, and we're over scaring ourselves. So we try to act more quickly, which is good. Um, but I, I, I just, you know, it's, it's about the words that we use versus the actual things happening behind the words. I think one thing that's good is when people are talking about things different ways, it makes us think about them. And also when things are existentially threatening, we want to pay attention to those. But the ways that they're existentially threatening and the ways that we're experiencing existential trauma, I don't think that we're really going to understand for another century or two, if ever. Um, and I certainly think they're not the way that we're describing them now. Well, creating existential trauma is one of the things that makes life fun, I guess. Yeah, it's just what we do to ourselves. <laughs> it gives us really exciting big problems to solve. Yeah, for sure. Do you think we will see these AI systems become conscious or convince us that they're conscious and then maybe we'll have relationships with them, romantic relationships? Well, I think people are going to have romantic relationships with them and I also think that some people would be convinced already that they're conscious. But I think in order, you know, what does it take to convince um, convince people that 
something is conscious, I think that we actually have to have an idea of what we're talking about, that it's con- like, it's like, we have to have a theory that explains when things are conscious or not, that's testable, right? And we don't have one right now. So I think until we we have that, it's always going to be this sort of gray area where some people think it hasn't and some people think it doesn't because we don't actually know what we're talking about that we think it has. So do you think it's possible to get out of the gray area and really have a formal test for consciousness? For sure. And and for life as you were- For sure. As we've been talking about for some of Yeah. Consciousness is a tricky one. It is a tricky one. I mean, that's why it's called the hard problem of consciousness, um, because it's hard. And, you know, it might even be outside of the purview of science, which means that we can't understand it in a scientific way. There might be other ways of coming to understand it, but that those may not be the ones that we necessarily want for technological utility um, or for developing laws with respect to, because the laws are, are you know, the things that are going to govern the technology. Um, well, I think that's actually where the, the hard problem of consciousness, a different hard problem of consciousness, yeah. is that I fear that humans will resist. That's the last thing they will resist, is calling something else conscious. Oh, that's interesting. I think it depends on the culture, though, because, I mean, some cultures already think, like, everything's imbued with, uh, you know, a life essence or kind of conscious. I don't think those cultures have nuclear weapons. No, they don't. And they're probably not building the most advanced technologies. The cultures that are primed for destroying the mm-hmm. other, uh, constructing a very effective propaganda machines of what the other is, uh, the group to hate, uh, are, the, are the cultures that uh, I worry would... Yeah, I know. Would, um, would be very resistant to uh, label something... Uh, and to, so to, to sort of acknowledge the consciousness laden in a thing that was created by us humans. And so, what do you think the risks are there that the conscious things will get angry with us and fight back? No, that that w- that we would torture and kill conscious beings. Oh, yeah, I think we do that quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, without I, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I mean, it goes back to your. And I, I don't know how to feel about this, but you know, like we talked already about the predator prey thing that like in some sense, uh, you know, being alive requires eating other things that are alive. And even if you're a vegetarian or, you know, like try to have like you're like you're still eating living things. I yeah. So maybe part of the the story of Earth will involve a predator prey dynamic between humans. That's struggle and for human existence. creations. Yeah. And no, but all I of that is part of the technology. But I don't here. like thinking about them as a, like our technologies as a separate species, because this again goes back to this sort of levels of selection issue. Um, and, you know, if you think about humans individually alive, you miss the fact that societies are also alive. And so I think about it much more in the sense of, I, I, an ecosystem is not the right word, but we don't have the right words for these things of like, and this is why I talk about the technosphere, it's a system that is both human and technological. It's not human or technological. Um, and so this is the part that I think we're really good for the, like, and this is driving in part a lot of the sort of attitude of like, I'll kill you <laughs> first with my nuclear weapons. Um, we're really good at identifying things as other. We're not really good at understanding when we're the same or when we're part of an integrated system that's actually functioning together in some kind of cohesive way. So even if you look at like, you know, the division in American politics or something, for example, it's important that there's multiple sides that are arguing with each other because that's actually how you resolve society's issues. It's not like a bad feature. I think like some of the sort of extreme positions and like the way people talk about it are maybe not ideal. Um, but, uh, but that's how societies solve problems. What it looks like for an individual is really different than the societal level outcomes and the fact that like there is, uh, I don't want to call it cognition or computation. I don't know what you call it, but like there is a process playing out in the dynamics of societies that we are all individual actors in. And like, we're not part of that, you know, like it requires all of us acting individually, but like this higher level structure is playing out some things and like things are getting solved for it to be able to maintain itself. Um, And that's the level that our technologies live at. They don't live at our level. They live at the societal level and they're deeply integrated with the social organism, if you want to call it that. Um, And so I really 
get upset when people talk about the species of artificial intelligence. I'm like, you mean we live in an ecosystem of all these kind of intelligent things and these animating technologies that were, uh, you know, in some sense helping to come alive. We are, we are generating them. But it's not like the biosphere eliminated all of its past history when it invented a new species. All of these things get scaffolded. And we're also augmenting ourselves at the same time that we're building technologies. I don't think we can anticipate what that system's going to look like. So in some fundamental way, you always want to be thinking about the planet as one organism. The planet is one living thing. What happens when it becomes multiplanetary? Is it still just the- Still the same causal chain. Same causal chain. It's like when the first cell split into two. That's what I was right. talking about. When the when a planet reproduces itself, the technosphere emerges enough understanding. It's, it's, it's like this recursive, like the entire history of life is just recursion, right? So you have an original life event. It evolves for 4 billion years, at least on our planet. It evolves a technosphere. The technologies themselves start to become having this property we call life, which is the phase we're undergoing now. It solves the origin of itself, and then it figures out how that process all works, understands how to make more life, and then can copy itself onto another planet so the whole structure can reproduce itself. And, and so it, the origin of life is happening again right now on this planet in the technosphere with the way that our planet is undergoing another transition, just like at the origin of life when geochemistry transitioned to bi biology, which is the global, for me, it was a planetary scale transition. It was a multi-scale thing that happened from the scale of chemistry all the way to planetary cycles. Um, it's happening now all the way from individual humans to the internet, which is a global technology and all the other things. Like there's this multi-scale process that's happening and transitioning us globally. And it is really like, it's a dramatic transition. It's happening really fast. Um, and you and think we're we'll, living in it. You think this technosphere that we created, this increasingly complex technosphere will spread to other planets? It'll I just hope be, so. I think so. You think we'll become a type two Kardashev civilization? I don't really like the Kardashev scale. Uh, and I it, it goes back to like, I don't like a lot of the narratives about life because they're very like, um, you know, survival of the fittest, energy consuming, this, that, and the other thing. It's very like, I don't know, sort of old world, you know, like conqueror mentality. Um, What's the alternative to that exactly? I mean, I think it does require life to use new energy sources in order to expand the way it is. So that part's accurate. But I think this sort of process of life uh, gener like being the, the mechanism that the universe creatively expresses itself, generates novelty, explores the space of the possible is really the thing that's most deeply intrinsic to life. And so, you know, these sort of... Um, energy consuming scales of technology, I think is missing the sort of actual feature that's most prominent about any alien life that we might find, which is that it's literally our universe, our reality, trying to creatively express itself and trying to find out what can exist and trying to make it exist. See, but past a certain level of complexity, unfortunately, maybe you can correct me, but we're built, all complex life on earth is built on a foundation of that predator prey dynamic. Yes. And so, like, I don't know if we can escape that. I don't no, know. No, we can't. But the, but this is why I'm okay with having a finite lifetime. And I, you know, one of the reasons I'm okay with that actually yeah. goes back to this issue of the fact that we're resource bound. We live in a, sure. you know, like we have a finite amount of material, whatever way you want to define material. I think, like for me, you know, material is time, material is information. But we have a finite amount of material. Um, if time is a generating mechanism, it's always going to be finite because the universe is, you know, like it's 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 a resource that's getting generated, but it has a size. Um, which means that all the things that could exist don't exist. And in fact, most of them never will. So death is a way to make room in the universe for other things to exist that wouldn't be able to exist otherwise. So if the universe over its entire temporal history wants to maximize the number of things, wants is a hard word, maximize a hard word, all these things are approximate, but wants to maximize the number of things that can exist, the best way to do it is to make recursively embedded stacked objects like us that have a lot of structure and a small volume of space and to have those things turn over rapidly so you can create as many of them as possible. So there for sure is a bunch of those kinds of things throughout the universe. Hopefully. Hopefully our universe is teeming with life.